When I was teaching AP Physics, one of my students' greatest challenges was dealing with Coulomb's Law. So I made four tricks to help them out, and I thought I would share it with everyone else. Okay, ready? Let's go. Electricity, 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 electricity. Trick number one, separate out the constants and the exponents and reduce as much as possible before using your calculator. For example, what is the electrostatic force between a 40 microcoulomb charge and a 20 microcoulomb charge 60 centimeters apart? So here's the trick. Split up all the numbers with all the exponents. So the force is K, Q1, Q2, divided by the distance squared. And then it's the exponents, the same thing. 10 to the ninth, 10 to the negative six, 10 to the negative six, divided by 10 to the negative two squared. So on this side, I purposefully chose the distance so some things cancel out. Let me show you. So six is two times three, so this is the same as 9 times 20 times 40 divided by 2 squared times 3 squared times 10 squared, which I'm just going to write 100. And 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9, and 10 squared or 100 cancels out here and cancels out here. So you end up with 2. Now let's do the exponents. 10 to the 9th. With exponents, you just add them if they're on the top and subtract them if they're on the bottom. Minus six, minus six, divide by a negative exponent means you add it. Plus two, plus two. Now I'm gonna do the math first. Six minus six is minus 12. Nine plus four is 13. So I guess I'll write it out. 10 to the 13 minus 12 is 10 to the one. So the final answer is 20 newtons. Yay! Of course, the numbers don't always work out that nicely, but even when the numbers are ugly, this is still a good trick. Let's go back to the first example. Those units, microcoulombs and centimeters, are really common in Coulomb's Law problems. So common, in fact, that it leads me to trick number two. So Coulomb's constant is measured in newtons meter squares per Coulomb squared, but it doesn't have to be measured in that. And in fact, I can convert it to be measured in newtons centimeter squared per micro Coulomb squared. Now I'm gonna show you my logic, but you don't have to be able to recreate it. You only have to be able to use the result. So let's change the units of K. K equals nine times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. There is 10 to the second centimeters in one meter, and there's 10 to the negative six Coulombs in one micro Coulomb. So, if we want to get rid of the meter squared and replace it with centimeter squared, we say times 10 to the second centimeters per one meter, and then we square it. And if we want to get rid of the coulomb and replace it with micro coulombs, we put one micro coulomb, 10 to the negative six coulombs, and we once again square it. And notice what happens to the units. The meter squared goes away and it's replaced with centimeter squared. The coulomb squared goes away and it's replaced with micro coulomb squared. So you end up with K equals nine times 10 to the ninth plus two plus two. I'm just gonna write plus four if that's okay. Minus six minus six minus 12 Newton centimeter squared per microcoulomb squared. Now we just, one more step, 
9 times 10 to the 9 plus 4 is 13 minus 12 is 1. So you end up with 90. Which is a way, way, way easier number to deal with. No exponents. Yay! So let's go back to the previous example and you'll see how e much easier it is. K is 90 Newton centimeter squared per microcoulomb squared. Q1 is 20 microcoulombs. Q2 is 40 microcoulombs. And the distance is 60 centimeters. So the force is 90 times 20 times 40 divided by 60 squared. And I like to reduce things because they make them much nicer. So that's 90 times 20 times 40. And 6 is 2 times 3. So that's 2 squared times 3 squared times 100. 3 squared is 9, 2 squared is 4, we get rid of the 2 of the zeros, and we end up with a value of 20 newtons. Nice, huh? You can also use k equals 90 newton centimeter squared per microcoulomb squared for the electric field, but it will give you a result of newtons per microcoulomb instead of newtons per coulomb. Here's an example. Find the electric field 30 centimeters from a 10 microcoulomb charge. So the electric field equation is kq over the distance squared. k we're going to use 90. q is going to be 10 microcoulomb. And the distance is 30. And we got to remember to square that. So that is 900. I'm just going to multiply it out divided by 30 squared, which happens to be 900. So the answer is the electric field is one Newton per microcoulomb. Ta-da! However, I would not recommend this trick for electric potential energy or electric potential because it's gonna be really hard to get the units of joules and volts respectively. For electric potential energy and electric potential, I would just stick with rule number one. Now let's get back to Coulomb's law. My students were often confused when there were three or more charges, especially if one of them was negative, which leads me to trick number three. Trick three, draw the force vectors and then ignore the sign of the charge. See, he here's the thing. Positive and negative charge is sort of an arbitrary construct. And really all that matters is that opposites attract and like repel. See, in the 1700s, Benjamin Franklin made a machine to generate static electricity that used a brush that rubbed against the glass tube. Benjamin Franklin was the first one to see that the charges weren't being created or destroyed, just moved from one object to the other. Since brooms sweep dirt, Franklin decided that the broom must sweep up the charges and said that the broom had a positive electrical fire and the glass had a lack of positive, which he called negative charge. It took almost 150 years for a man named J.J. Thompson to discover the electron. And then they found that the glass tube actually gained negative electrons and left the brush with a positive net charge. All of this is to say that there's nothing inherently negative about negative charges and positive about positive charges. So you just draw the direction of the forces and then you ignore the sign of the charge. For example, so for this, I'm going to go back to my first problem. Imagine you have any 20 microcoulomb charge and a 40 microcoulomb charge, 60 centimeters apart. But what happens now if you add another charge right in the middle. Let's add a 30 microcoulomb charge right in the middle. Let's call this object A, object B, and object C. Now object A is going to be repelled by object B, and it's going to be repelled by object C. A, B, 
F A C. And object B is going to be repelled by object A. So this is going to be F A B. And it's going to be repelled by object C, F B C. And finally, this object is going to be repelled by both objects, F A C, F B C. Now we just need to know what these forces are, and then we can add them or subtract them to find the total forces on each object. Now, as we found before, the force between object A and C is 90 times 20 times 40 divided by 60 squared, which turned out to be 20 newtons. Now we have to find the force between A and B. We're still going to use the 90 for K. The first charge is 20, the second charge is 30, and now the distance is 30 squared. Now 30 squared is 900. I'm going to rewrite this just so we have it. 90 times 20 times 30 divided by 900. 90 goes away, this goes away, and you end up with 2 times 30, or 60 newtons. Isn't that a great trick? And then finally, last but not least, force between object B and object C is 90 times 30, the charge of B, times 40, the charge of C, divided by the distance, which is 30 centimeters, squared. So I'm going to write this out, 90 times 30 times 40 divided by 900, and you get 3 times 40, or 120 newtons. So what is the total force on object A? Is 20 plus 60 going backwards, which is 80, I'm going to write negative 80 newtons in the x direction, backwards. What's the total on B? Well, it's got FAB 60 newtons forward and 120 newtons backwards. So it's a 120 newtons, negative 120 newtons plus 60, or negative 60 newtons backward. Finally, the total force on the third object is FAC forward, 20 newtons, plus, sneak in the 20 newtons, FBC forward, 120 newtons, plus 120, equals 140 newtons in the x direction. Ta-da! Now take a moment to figure out what happens if all of these charges are negative. Pause the screen for a second and say what happens if all of these are negative. Negative, negative. Okay, do you have your answer? Did you get exactly the same thing? Well, you should have because they're all the same charge so they all repel. Okay, let's do something slightly different. What if only the middle one was negative? These two are positive. The value for the forces is exactly the same. The only difference is now the direction is different. Between A and C, it's still repelling on force A, but between A and B, it's now attractive. Boink, boink, just changes the direction of the arrow. Now on this object, which is negative, it switches these two. It's attracted to this one, and it's attracted to this one. So, ready? Finally, this one will be repelled by A and attracted to B. Whoop! And A is going to be force AB, which is positive, minus force AC, which is going to be force AB, 60, minus force AC, 20. It'll be 40 newtons in the positive x direction. The total on B will be a force attractive to the sec third one, and then minus the force AB, which is BC is 120, 
Oh my goodness. Minus force BC minus force AB, which is 60. Ends up being 60 newtons in the x direction. And the total on C is going to be force AC minus force BC, which is AC is 20. BC is 120, ends up being negative 100 newtons in the x direction. So this is very different values than before. But the math is not more complicated than just adding or subtracting 60 from 20. What if the charges are not on a line? Well, then you have forces that are not on a line, and then you have to add them with the laws of vectors meaning that you have to add all the x components up, you have to add all the y components up, and then you use the Pythagorean theorem to get the total result. Or if you have two identical vectors, there is a fabulous trick to solving the result, and that is trick number four. Trick four, adding two identical vectors has an equation. Okay, we're gonna start with two vectors that are identical. Vector 1, vector 2. Now it should be pretty clear to you guys that if you add two identical vectors, and yes, these don't look particularly identical, then the resulting vector is going to be right in the middle. Does that seem clear? Well, I hope so because I'm not going to prove it. And I'm going to call this angle theta, which is the half angle between them because the result is halfway through it. Now, if we're going to add these up, this one has a value of f cosine theta in this direction. And it has a value of f sine theta in this direction. So the first one is f cosine theta in the x direction. And we're just calling the midpoint the x direction and f sine theta in the y direction. And this one has a value of f cosine theta in the x direction and negative f sine theta in the y direction. So guess what happens when you add them together? The y's go away. Goodbye and you end up with 2f cosine theta. This is an incredibly useful skill. If you're adding two vectors together that are identical, the result is 2f cosine theta. Okay, let's do an example. Imagine you have an isosceles triangle with charges q on each of the corners and length a. What is the total force on any of the charges? Well, they're a repelling force because they're all positive. So this one has a force of kq squared over a squared. And this one also has a force of kq squared over a squared. These are two identical forces. So how do we add them together? Well, the result is going to be right in the middle. And the result is going to be 2 kq squared over a squared, two times the force, times the cosine of the half angle between them. This angle is 30 degrees. How do I know it's 30 degrees? Because this angle is 60 degrees. Cosine 30 degrees. By the way, cosine 30 is one half, so this ends up being one half times two, it ends up being kq squared over a squared. The end. Remember, this only works if you have two vectors that are identical that you're adding. But sometimes you have three vectors, two of which are identical, and you can still use this trick to add the two identical ones first. Here's an example. Imagine you have four charges. Q, 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 Q in a square of distance a. Yeah, it's supposed to be a square. It doesn't really look like a square, does it? Sorry. 
What is the total force on any corner? Well, each corner has three other charges, so it has three forces. One going up, a squared, one going sideways, kq squared over a squared, and one in the middle from this one. Now notice I make this force a little smaller because the distance is bigger. kq squared over 2a squared. I know that because this is a triangle. a squared plus a squared equals this distance squared. Now I have three forces. The easiest way to add them is these two are identical. So let's add them first. So if you add two identical forces, the equation is 2 times the force times the cosine of the angle between them. So that would be 2 kq squared over a squared times the cosine of, you got it, 45 degrees. And when you add them together, bonus, it's pointing diagonally. So the total force is this plus kq squared over 2a squared. If you want to simplify it a little bit, cosine of 45 degrees is root 2 over 2. So you can write it as 2kq squared over a squared times root 2 over 2 plus kq squared over 2a squared. If you really want to make it pretty, but you don't have to do this, you can take out the kq squared over 2a squared kq squared over 2a squared, and you got 2 root 2 plus 1. Ta-da! You can use this trick for any vectors that you're adding, including electric field. Let me give you a common example. So a very common problem given for electric fields is imagine you have charges q and q a distance 2a apart. A, A. And you want to know the electric field as a function of x along the x-axis. So that would be this distance is the distance is the square root of a squared plus x squared. And this one also has a distance to the charge. Same value. So at this point, it feels an electric repulsion from this charge. So the electric field would be this way, and it would have a value of kq over distance squared. And this one would also have a repelling electric field from this one with a value of kq over, oops, sorry, kq over distance squared. So how do you find the total electric field? Well, you're just adding two identical vectors. So the result is 2 times the electric field times the cosine of the angle between them. So we got 2 times kq over the distance squared and the cosine of the angle between them. Now, we don't know the angle, right? This angle. We don't know it. But we know it's identical to this angle. And hey, the cosine of this angle is adjacent over diameter. So that would be x over d. So the result is the electric field is 2kq x over distance cubed in the positive x direction, where distance equals the square root of a squared plus x squared. That's it. To review, my tricks are 1. Separate out all the constants and the exponents and cancel out as much as you can before you use the calculator. 2. When you can, use k equals 90 newton centimeter per microcoulomb squared instead of 9 times 10 to the 9th. 3. Draw the force vectors and then don't worry about the signs of the charges. Four, if you're adding two identical vectors, then the result is in the middle of the two vectors and the value is two times the force
times the cosine of the half angle between them. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me in the comments below and I will try my best to answer them. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up, share it on social media, all that jazz. I usually make videos about the history of science. For example, I made a video about how Charles Coulomb came up with this equation in the first place. You should check it out. Big thank you to my Patreons and as usual, stay safe out there, okay? Bye.